Hey, it's Rod Yates. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Humans of Music, a Jaxta podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned. And my special guest today is British singer-songwriter James Bay. James has just released his third album, Leap. He finished recording it in early 2020, but in an all-too-familiar story, the pandemic hit and put all of his release and touring plans on hold. The silver lining was that it gave James time to write more songs and reevaluate what he wanted to say with the record. We talk about that whole journey in this interview, as well as his upbringing in the UK, surviving the explosion of success that came with his debut album, Chaos on the Calm, and loads more. But we started by talking about an inspirational quote that really set the tone for his new album, Leap. It seems to be like a, a really, uh, I guess, pivotal moment in the record's gestation was a quote that you read from John Burroughs, which was, Leap and the net will appear. Why did that resonate with you at this particular point of your career? Great question. And it's hard to sort of think of ways that it sort of d- that it didn't resonate. Like it, it just, it sort of ran through me like a real sort of jolt of energy because... And I didn't realize in the moment, I've realized more this bit more in hindsight, but I know in the moment it just inspired me, literally it inspired me to kind of get up onto my feet and, and do and create. When it says leap, it says go for it. It says the net will appear and there's no guarantee. It's just trust me. You do, you do what you do. Just mm. go and do the thing and a net will appear. Right. And there's a part of me that typically, and probably a part of a lot of us that typically says, Okay, tell me more about this net, though, because I really want some... I'd like some guarantees. Yeah. I would like some guarantees about this net. Can we talk about the net for a while? (laughs) And the phrase, every time you go back to the phrase, the phrase says, nah, we can't talk about it. Yeah. We're not going to talk about the net. You're going to leap. (laughs) It works for me sort of in hindsight, because I look when I discovered the quote, I sort of glanced back across what is now nearly 10 years of touring and being signed to a record label and all of this stuff that looks so fancy in the first instance... Um, and then sort of is followed with lots and lots of hard work, and rightly so. And I realised that not a day has really changed or been different. Um, I've achieved some things, and I'm very proud of the things I've achieved. But on the day I achieve those things, I celebrate. The next day, what I've realised is we're sort of back to square one, or at least that's exactly how I should go about every day. And this Mm. phrase, this quote, reinvigorated that understanding in me. It also made me think about how you know, I remember doing open mic nights. I remember walking into a pub with a microphone in the corner. Maybe there was a stage, but there probably wasn't. And there's a bunch of people after work having a drink, trying to have a quiet time and just relax. And then I pipe up. <laughs> and my whole goal, my whole goal the whole time is is win them over. Yeah. Win them over from their precious conversation and their precious after work drink. And I had to take a sort of leap of faith, which the the phrase again sort of, operates along the same concept of just taking a leap of faith. I had to take a leap of faith into those situations every single time. I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I didn't know if a net would appear. I had no idea. Mm. And I suppose back then, I, I, I didn't really feel as though I had the time to pay any interest to whether a net would appear. I just had to be leaping all the time. Mm. I had to be doing, I had to be singing, I had to be writing, I had to be trying, and I had to be trying again. And... Um, there, there were some days, I think, between then and now, across the last nearly 10 years, where I've slipped a little and started to sort of focus on just other, other details surrounding all of that. Sure. And I was reminded when I read this quote as I was making this album, I'd nearly finished making it at this point, yeah. that every day it's still the same. I have to just, I have to just keep going for it. And, and there's no, you can't be taking anything for granted. Every, every day is sort of a new day uh, with every kind of possibility. Yeah. So I, I know it sounds, um, uh, you know, a little bit like a sort of motivational speech. It's not quite supposed to, but um, it was quite good to sort of receive it like that and, f- and feel that. Absolutely. That that idea of, I guess, over the past 10 years where perhaps you'd taken your eye off that ball a little bit on occasion, I guess success makes that uh, that desire to leap or that willingness to leap possibly harder to come by. Is that right? Because you maybe feel like you've got more to lose. It, it does. It changes it. It changes your your perspective on on leaping and 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 just giving things a go. It changes them for the better and the worse. It's easy to sort of feel in moments like you've done a lot of one thing, so it must be time to do more of another thing. 
but also yeah it does it, it changes things for sort of better as well because you obviously I suppose I experienced the benefits of trying and trying harder and trying again at writing at performing you know I remember there's a venue a good example of, of that whole thing is is um, there's a venue in London called Shepherd's Bush Empire. It was the first venue I ever saw a show in when I was a kid. I absolutely adore the venue. What was the and show? It was a complete and utter like it was a dream. Oh, I saw a guy called Paolo Nutini, oh, who yeah. I, I adore. He's a brilliant, brilliant artist. Way over ten years ago now, I think. Uh, anyway, it was on his first album, and yeah, I I remember I sold out one night at Shepherd's Bush Empire, and then I sold out two nights, and I couldn't believe I could not believe it. And the gigs came, the two nights came came along. They were somewhere in the middle of a UK tour. And um, I got on stage so excited on the first night with my band. I had a drummer. We were going to make a racket. I was also going to play all these little intimate moments and it was going to be dynamic and exciting and really brilliant and beautiful. And I just couldn't wait for the whole experience and for everyone to see it. And as I sort of approached the stage, I sort of felt that bit of nerves that comes on that little wave, that little tidal wave that sort of washes across. And I know when I came off that stage that I had been something of a rabbit in the headlights. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'd been like, I had been a bit consumed by the occasion and not quite able to deliver. And I wonder about that first night and whether to this day, I just took for granted the reality that the tickets had sold, that mm. it said sold out on the front on the front door and that I'd, I'd sort of done it. So I felt very fortunate and lucky to have a second night because I came off the stage on that first night and I knew it wasn't quite right. And the, the two shows in my mind were night and day. The second show, which I don't know, it was like a Saturday night instead of a Friday night or whatever, was a whole different thing. I let my shoulders drop. Right. I focused myself and I gave it my absolute everything. And I didn't think about anything other than the moment I was in. Okay. And that's the right kind of leap. Absolutely. Well, it, I mean, talking about leaping. So when it came time to leap for this record, what did that leap look like? That's a good question. Um, it looked really mostly and most importantly like a real sort of shift in my writing, particularly lyrically. You know, I have written from a very honest place always. And I know now more than ever, as I look back, even across the making of Leap and then further back to my first album and everything in between, that I was writing from a very honest place since the start, but it was more abstract, essentially and maybe poetic, and there was a whole load of sort of artistic license to sort of create different sort of interesting metaphors and, and visuals in the lyrics around the emotions that I was trying to sort of depict. But on this record, I took a big leap when I sort of realized that I was really going to get what I wanted to get across if I, found, if I could find the courage to just say it. Right. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a different level, I think, in songwriting, and I hadn't, I hadn't got there before. Now, I talked about honesty... But the, 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 I, I went, I came with the same honesty, but I, I chose to sort of go deeper on vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel there is something of a difference between the two things. I, like I say, I knew I was being honest and writing from, from true experience on all of my previous songs. But this time, just, just sort of taking the lyrics from any of these songs. I mean, I'll choose, I'll go with One Life to use as an example. The second verse in that song is the real reason why the song works as this joyous hopeful and kind of uplifting notion of love because in the second verse even though the choruses say i've only got one life and i want you in it and it's this declaration it's in the second verse that i say now sometimes i get sad at the front at the back in the middle of the happiest moments because good things can go bad easily i mean that lyric in it in in all just in itself references my entire 2019 because on the surface it was all good and all mm. happy but i was kind of concerned and worried and anxious and insecure about how it might all just fall away all of a sudden because I'd lost sight of sort of direction of sort of where I was going as an artist. So that lyric in that second verse of that song grounds the song and it took an extra amount of and degree of vulnerability to arrive at that place and be, be have the courage to, to commit to that as a lyric. And it also, for me, you know, as a, as a listener of other songs and then of a listener of this song and as a maker of music, allows me to to involve the sort of bombast of the lyrics in the chorus i've only got one life and i want you in it right tell me that you'll never let me go and then it, you know it goes a little bit more sort of over the top and more sort of artistic i suppose but it needs that second verse that song 
And that, that degree of vulnerability where I really thought kind of more directly reflects what's been going on in my life for me to feel like I can get away with the scale of the, the lyrics in, in the rest of the song and particularly in the chorus. Because mm. it's a big gesture. Sure. But why, why now? Why, why were you able to tap into that vulnerability now? Well, I'm always trying to push a boundary one way or another in, my, in, my, in what I make. Um, on my second album, I did that in a very kind of obvious way. It, right. was, it was obviously sonically, there was suddenly all sorts of synthesizers and way, way more sort of electric guitar sounds and drum sounds, different approaches, many layers. It wasn't the sort of simplistic approach of the first album and of just previous music. Um, and of course, visually, my second record was a sort of different experience for fans as well. But and I adored that process. I loved it. And I felt like it was, I was supposed to sort of evolve as an artist. I felt like it was absolutely my duty to sort of do the things I did artistically, creatively. And this time on this album, it was time to basically speaking, push some boundaries again, because I never want to do anything exactly the same as before. Mm. I, I might level off at some point and maybe do a couple of records that feel like they all belong to a similar sound. We shall see. I don't, I don't really know. Because wh when I say that, and when I say both of them, all of these things, I'm reflecting things that I know my heroes have done. And I, we're all just trying to kind of replicate and learn from our heroes. So, sure. But on this album, it was lyrics. I was trying to push a boundary and the boundary was lyrics. And I wanted to go from what felt like early on more abstract to, to something more direct and to just saying it, like I said before, and, yeah. and, and tapping into a, a deeper level of vulnerability. That's something I've found hard to do. That's something how I've found hard to do so socially in my sort of private life and publicly, socially and professionally. And it's something that I think we can all agree still, unfortunately, in this day and age, just to be a man talking about my feelings or our feelings, whoever we are. It's only so accepted. It's not. As, it's not quite as accepted as as we want it to be. I mean, it's hard. It's a. It's a difficult detail for anybody, you know, whoever you are, to talk about deeper sort of feelings and be more open about them. But I have mm. found that the cliche of being a man and being strong and pushing your chest out and not not being too emotional is still something that I I am plagued by. So I was trying to push that boundary. Right. You, you mentioned 2019 there and how on the surface it looked like a good year because you've got that, what, three months with Ed Sheeran, I think a six-week yeah. headline tour of the US. Um, you put out your EP. Lots of stuff happening. Um, did those feelings that you spoke about, that lack of direction, did, did that catch you off guard? Were you surprised at that? Definitely. Yeah, I think because I have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on sort of right in front of me on the surface, which in that year was all the touring and a bit of releasing music as well. So any struggle, emotional sort of unrest can get sort of suppressed and pushed down and try, I tried to ignore it. But yeah, it got the better of me barely halfway through that year. And I started sort of writing around that. And I wrote like I always do as some sort of therapy um, because it can be a very therapeutic process. And it was okay. You know, I think it was really, I was really going through a process at that time. I was writing what I think were really quite heavy, quite sad songs, which on the one hand is something that sort of comes naturally to me. But on the other hand, it was a lot of weight. It was mm. just a lot of darkness. And um, however many months or whatever of, of going behind the scenes and, and writing went by, and I looked at the pile of songs I'd made, and there was one or two to be picked out of it, and quite a lot to be sort of pushed into the bin. Um, right. <laughs> uh, it, ha it happens. It's okay. It's all part of the process. They say to write one keeper, one song that you want to keep per year is an oh. achievement. And I think I can, I, can, I can totally agree with that. I can totally agree with that. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that's very much the artists talking because we are our greatest critics. But anyway... I like to think I'm, I'm writing a little, a few more than one a year that I'm sort of <laughs> keeping. That's, that is the goal at this point. But um, there was a few songs that came out of that period that I look back at them and I, I'll keep saying that. I keep talking about hindsight because that really is the process for me. I write in an instinctive kind of way. I, I, I say what I feel. and I, I try not to do too much thinking in the process. I try to just be present sure. with the feeling I'm trying to express. And sometimes that makes for a better and, and sometimes that makes for a worse song. It's, it's not really about whether it's better or worse as I'm writing it. It's about being kind of genuine and, like I say, present. So I talk about hindsight and looking back at what I've created a lot because, because that's the process. And so I did that, at that uh, you know, further into 2019. I was, I was listening back and I found a few songs that they started like all of the songs in that time. They started sad and heavy and, mm. and from a place of uncertainty and insecurity and even anxiety at times. And 
In fact, I remember a working title that it's a song that never got written. The title was Anxiety Dream because it was just, I couldn't shake having them right. for so much of that year. And I thought it was sort of kind of an interesting, slightly abstract and also slightly sort of literal, maybe inspiring sort of springboard line. And I never wrote it and I don't know if I ever will because maybe it's just too on the nose. But right. anyway, there was a lot of that, but there was one or two songs that found their way from, from a, a heavy first verse to, to a hope in the chorus or in the in the bridge or in the second verse or as the song progressed there was like a there was a silver lining sort mm -hmm. of revealing itself in in the lyrics i remember one of those songs was called everybody needs someone and it's one of the very few songs from that time well not very few songs but it's well it's one of a few songs from that time that made made it onto leap as i clocked that i'm glad even at this point as i talk about it that i recognized in the way that i did that it was the thing to follow right because when you're down about something when you're down about something it's very easy to want to kind of wallow in it sure and i know i was in that kind of place in 2019 as well um so i so i decided to sort of follow that and and, and it led to a to better songs right and it's in, it's interesting with the record because it had quite a long gestation you you went to nashville you recorded the album in 2020 and then the yeah. pandemic hit and as the years went on, you started writing more songs and I think replaced about six of the songs from those Nashville sessions with these new songs. Yeah. What's, what's that moment like when you go, ah, oh, I don't think we've finished. I think I've got more songs. I need, to, I need to start again with some of this. Well, it's strange that it took a pandemic, <laughs> a sort of global pandemic, to, to, for me to sort of feel like I had an opportunity. You know, it's a it was a strange time. This, this moment presented itself that nobody ever expected, and I obviously certainly didn't. And just in terms of my personal circumstance, making a record, I never expected to finish a record in March 2020. Obviously, be presented with a, a global pandemic that, one way or another, nudged me into a position where I said, all right, well, let's just check out the music. I had so much time to sit with the music I'd made that like, maybe it was always going to happen. Maybe if you gave me that amount of time on every record before releasing it right. and just after having finished it then maybe I would make all those changes. Because I often find people say, when do you know a record's finished? You don't, or I don't. I just sort of come to a point where I'm willing to close the book. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? It was, it was all a surprise. And trying to sort of remain sort of as present as I possibly could was a big part of the challenge as far as accepting that it's maybe okay and that there may be, and this was a big unknown, that there may be is time to write and consider trying to better some of the record I'd made. Sure. All of that stuff ended up happening. I guess it was interesting to find on the one hand, I had more to say about the stuff I'd been writing. But on the other hand, what's really wonderful about the fact that I got this opportunity to better some of the record I've made is that I had a better understanding by the end of 2020, having listened to the Nashville album so much, as I started to write again, I had a better understanding of, of the sort of power and magic of these hopeful songs, the few hopeful songs that were on the Nashville album. And I just, I realized I wasn't done with that hmm. emotion and that sort of mechanism writing wise. I wasn't actually done with it. So I went on and wrote Nowhere Left to Go. Uh, I wrote Give Me the Reason. I wrote Save Your Love, which was a really, a real therapy song. Like that's a song to me. Right. And if for any, for anybody who's listening to it and, um, and, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, there's someone sitting in their car singing along to it. I, I hope they can, if they need to, they, they can be okay singing it to themselves. Mm. It's a song that says, you know, don't give too much of yourself away. Save some of you for you. It's sort of, that's sort of what it's about. And, and these are songs that offer like a silver lining, essentially. Right. It, from a, when, you're in a, when you're in a place of despair, I guess. Okay. Um, so I'm glad I got that time. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I got that time. I think I answered your question. I you did. Remember. You did. One of, <laughs> one of the uh, the key muses of the record, um, if I understand correctly, is your partner, Lucy. Um, you've yeah. been together yeah. since since you were 16. And you mentioned the song One Life, which I believe is, is inspired by her. But mm. there's also a song, Better, where it's got the lyric, you took my hand through the bright lights when they blinded me. Um, yeah. Is that about Lucy? And is that... Is that how she grounded you, particularly when the chaos and the calm took off and those bright yeah. lights got very bright? Yeah, it's all a big fat yes <laughs> to, your, to your question. Um, I, I really, I appreciate you uh, kind of picking that up and recognizing that because um, also I, it's lovely to sort of speak in a, in a more long form fashion about this stuff, man, because, you know, as you, as you may or may not know, I do so, we, we do so many 10 minute interviews yes. and 10 and, fif and 15 minute soundbite things. So this is, I, yeah. Anyway, yes, that the better, <laughs> better is really, it really is that song. It's a, it's a very autobiographical 
song, particularly so on, on this album and, and throughout, you know, all of the songs I've written. And um, I think, it, yeah, it's really there to, as far as vulnerability goes from me on this album, it's one of the kind of most emphasised examples. It, it took me a long time, I think, up until this point at least, to work out how to make it feel okay to me to say in a song, thank you, I need you, I love you. Those are so concentrated, those emotions. Mm. They're intense, they're intense, you know, and as we listen to music, we might be processing those kind of emotions, but we don't necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily just want a song that, that says those sorts of things so on the nose. And I haven't, I don't think I've said those things particularly on the nose in, in, in these songs and we'll use better as the example, but that's why I've, I've been able to sort of tick two very important boxes for myself. It's none of it's too on the nose. It's all creative, artistic enough. But at the same time, I've been able to say those things that I just said, like I've been able to say them in a song. And to Lucy, who of course is so immensely important to me in my life um, and has been for such a long time. And since, bef you know, pretty much since before I was doing open mic nights, which I feel like I've done my entire life. I know I was doing them when I was being in bands as a 14 year old before I'd even met Lucy. Yeah, You know, I was walking into pubs with my brother and my mates, uh, guitars in hand, saying, do you want a bit of music? <laughs> and um, some of them said yes. You know, that was our... We weren't even allowed... We weren't old enough to be in the pubs, but if we went in in the afternoon, started playing, then sometimes they didn't notice and it was like 10pm. Right. And we were still in there. Anyway. <laughs> was that Roadrunner? Was that the name of one of the yeah, bands of your yeah, brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. That's good digging. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That that was Roadrunner. And we had a hundred different names as well over the time. But um, Better is very autobiographical. And it, it's funny how a lot of what I say, I think about the first verse, I grew up running from the best of me and I'm still not sure just who I'm supposed to be. These emotions resonate with how I feel today. That's the strange thing about suddenly, I mean, I was, you know, some people are a lot younger than I was when people started to sort of recognize me in the street and all that stuff and know my music and get, I, when I started to get played on the radio. But even at 22, 23, 24, when that started happening to me, you sort of, on the one hand, have to grow up very fast. And on the other hand, it slows right down. Hmm. So that, that sense of still, you know, of, of growing up, not sure who I'm supposed to be and still not sure. It, I've still, I still feel it. Um, and I was able to sort of put it in this song and talk about how I've managed to share that emotion to halve the problem with this brilliant person in my life. And then in, in the chorus, it all sounds almost a bit too sort of neat and tidy, but like in the chorus, I, I, to, it took me a long time to write that chorus because I love this sort of involvement in the verses and then to just sort of come to this the simple notion of but everything's better as soon as you're next to me. Right. I know I, fall, I, know I fall apart, but you fix me with your heart. It was almost too good to be true, I suppose. And, and, and yet, it, I think I've matured enough at this point as a songwriter to understand that it absolutely worked and was okay to, to be that mm. as, a, as a chorus. Lucy must love this record. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. You catch my sort of wry smile. She does, man. I, 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 I can't, I have to give her entire sort of credit. She's brilliant and she loves it and she's, she's so proud. And, and yet, I, I, it's very important for me to say that probably one of the things that 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 keeps us where we are together as a pair is the fact that she she doesn't uh sort of suffer fools and she doesn't let anything anyone or any song get away too easy <laughs> um so what am i trying to say i'm trying to say and this is exactly how i want it and how i need it i write songs all the time and she never ever is like going oh my god what an incredible <laughs> song never <laughs> Never. Uh, th there is no way in this life that she's ever going to be that person. And thank goodness me. Thank mm. God she's not that person. <laughs> so it, what I'm saying is that when she really loves something that I've made, it's a, it's a very nuanced sort of little nod and smile that, sure. that let me know. Nice. Because I mean, if she, if she went any further than that, I would get way too big for my boots. <laughs> um, and she cannot, I, I don't need that, but she don't need that. Nobody needs that. Right. So yeah, no, she, she does love it though, man. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I, and, and I feel very lucky that she does because she sure as hell does not have to. We'll be back with more from James after this break. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with James Bay. You mentioned, um, you know, running into going to the pubs with your brother and, and with Roadrunner and, and playing shows. And I'd really like to go back and just talk to you briefly about that time in, at, when you were growing up in, um, in Hitchin. Sure. Um, yeah. 
what sure. before music comes into your life, before, you know, there's that story that you heard Derek and the Dominoes later and that's what made you pick up the mm. guitar. Before that, mm. when you were just young, what was what were you like yeah. as a kid? What was growing up in Hitchin like? Uh, it was very safe and simple and it was a real little sort of suburban commuter town. It's the kind of town at the start of a movie right. about somebody or something that either goes catastrophically wrong or becomes <laughs> crazy or something like that it's 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 like it sets the scene sort of and then and then and then eventually we kind of leave it and 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 so it played a really vital part in my growing up as far as like having a a, a nice sort of having a blank canvas to sort of try some stuff out on by which i mean you know i wanted to play football as a kid i wanted to be a footballer i was big into sports and there was a lot of that going on in uh, you know at schools in in my hometown so that was an opportunity I could sort of really explore. And, and I remember at home, you know, I could spend a lot of time at home just sort of drawing. I was very creative as well. So I really liked to draw for the first sort of 10 years of my life. I hadn't even picked up an instrument and I was drawing constantly and obsessing over animated films and cartoons and all that stuff. And what I will say is all the while music was on. Me and my brother were only 18 months apart in age. He's just a little bit older than me. And um, we had cassette players and we got a CD player and we had a karaoke machine and there was and the radio was always on there was always music on and, and like he he's creative as well and he would draw and paint and stuff and we would muck around and we, we got a playstation we'd sit on the playstation but we'd always mute the playstation not all kids do this yeah and i've i've, gr- I've come i've sort of grown up and realized a lot of kids understandably like the sound effects that come with the game but we would mute what we were playing a wrestling game a football game a racing game something like that and put on songs we put on an elvis compilation or 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 I'm trying to think of all the different stuff. We had lots of pop music. We had, I remember I got Eminem's debut album on cassette, The Real Slim Shady. Right. We got Britney Spears' first album. Like We loved pop music. We loved old stuff. My mum had loads of soul. We had like James Brown cassette, all this different stuff. My dad had like loads of Chuck Berry and the Rolling Stones. And we didn't really know much about it in those early years. We just knew if we liked it or not. So we put all that stuff on along with what we were doing. So I was always being affected by music and um you know, we'd sort of, I'd have a hairbrush dancing around in front of the mirror, <laughs> all of that stuff, you know, trying to do, uh, all kids are trying to sort of get Michael Jackson's dance moves perfected. Right. All of that stuff. So, and James Brown stuff and all of that. So that was the experience growing up. And when I talk about it being a sort of blank canvas kind of town, it made sense one day to start working out how to get away. Right. Um, so that time did eventually come, but like, uh, and I was the last generation to be a kid of 10, 11, 12, even 14, 15, rolling around town on a skateboard, on a bike with some friends, no mobile phones, mm. no smartphones. Didn't exist yet. They were just coming in. So there was one, a few, one or two kids. As we were all getting to the age when we would leave school, there was one or two kids who had them. By the time I was at uni, more people had them, but I was still a little slow to that. So it was interesting. I was the last generation. I know because a lot of people had siblings who were in the year below or two years below at school and they had them at school right but i I was the last generation who had to call from my parents landline and say (laughs) i'll meet you in town at three yeah and and you would wait almost an hour in town (laughs) just standing in front of a shop i remember and if they didn't turn up you give it like a full hour and then you're gone sort of thing so i feel like this weird in between i can relate so much to so many generations that are older than me and i can just about relate to quite a lot of sort of quite a few of the younger generations anyway right that was my time growing up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that um, it's fascinating what you said about at some point you decided right it's you're looking for your way out. Is that what music was to you when you started playing the guitar? Is that what is that where you saw as your ticket ticket out? So initially, for a few years, from about thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, maybe even seventeen years old, about five years there, Hitch in my hometown was we had one proper music venue and we had about five pubs that had a decent space in which to play a gig and. In the summer, we had a festival, small festival, but a, a, an exciting opportunity to get in front of the biggest crowd the town could offer, which mm. was basically half the town watching you play. That gave enough for five or so years there. But what I was doing that whole time, we were, we were, we were doing band practice, we were playing shows. I mean, we had actually, a credit to my parents, like I remember a couple of nights before I'd left school, uh, a, a couple of weeks um, a few sort of individual weeks in my memory where even my parents were excited that we had a gig on every single night, Monday to Sunday. Really? Seven, there were some moments. Seven days a week? Yeah, we had a, 
We had a few ones. We, we, we were going into neighboring towns. The neighboring towns around Hitchin are very similar to Hitchin. So I remember those. And, and my parents were like pumped. I remember my mum going like, what are we doing for dinner? Like, what time's your sound check? So what time do we need to eat? Really good times. My parents weren't always coming to the show, granted. They, they, they love to come, but, but, but when there's seven, seven in a week, they're sort of having a few nights in, in front of the TV. But um, it was so cool do, doing that. And, and so the town even offered that for a while. But I was, between band practices and gigs, I was, you know, devouring records, I got quite into live records because that really helped me think about shaping a live performance, a live show, which is obviously what we were doing all the time. We were doing crappy demo recordings and stuff, but live records, uh, I was going to say as well though, sorry, uh, DVDs. I was at this point, again, like we, YouTube had arrived by the time I was about 13, but it wasn't what it is today. So there was a lot that wasn't on there. Um, but there were, I was learning from watching people on YouTube, but I was doing a lot of learning. There was an Eric Clapton uh it was called 24 nights he used to do these long standing long running um residencies, uh, residencies <laughs> at the royal albert hall uh, which my dad in the 80s went to a couple of those which is right. amazing but so there was that there was that i used to watch that a lot i used to listen to uh, there's a springsteen compilation called i think it's 1975 to 1985 Bruce yeah. springsteen and the east street band live it's just a, quite a famous sort of box set mm. great photo on the front sort of black and he's walking along the stage with the lights yeah. by his feet He's got his telecaster and stuff. There was a Black Crows live at the Fillmore West that was a DVD that we absolutely loved and watched a lot. The big one was The Last Waltz. I discovered this DVD when I was on holiday with my parents when I was 15. We went to, they had a friend who had a place in Mallorca and he was like, he played guitar and he had, he was, he had like, a, he was building a studio in the basement. It wasn't finished when we were there. So it was just kind of rubble. But like, he had a, a bunch of, it was like a, bo it was boiling hot and I, I'm very pale. I don't tan. <laughs> Um, I, I was sat inside one afternoon flicking through his DVDs and there was this DVD, this box with a Telecaster on the front. I'm sold. Yeah. Put it in the thing. It says The Last Waltz. I don't know what it means. I looked on the back and there, I saw Eric Clapton's face. I was like, I'm sold. Neil Young, yeah. Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I'm sold. Like, put it in the thing. Let's see what it does. And it was, the, it was The Last Waltz, which is just the most. Martin Scorsese made The Last Waltz. It's the first ever proper sort of rock documentary thing. And it's full of a sort of a live performance that they did in 1975 um, at a place called Winterland, and I think it's in San Francisco. And they uh, and they they're celebrating the end of their career. And they're sort of finishing the band, and they have all these guests: Clapton, Van Morrison, Dr. John, Joni Mitchell, Paul Butterfield from the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, like loads and loads and loads. Muddy Waters, Neil Diamond, um, Ronnie Wood, Ringo Starr, they're all there. Bob Dylan comes up. It's unbelievable. Oh my God, it's, it's got a very, very famous version of The Weight, yes. which is the band and the Staples singers, and yeah. it's absolutely unbelievable. I was 15 years old. I might have been 14, it depends. If it was 2005, but it was summer, then I was actually 14 years old. And I just, me and my brother just watched like, unbelievable. Like, uh, how the West, how, there was a, there was a, there was a, a Led Zeppelin one called something like How the West Was Won. That's right, yeah. We obsessed over that. Unbelievable. Yeah. We just went hard at that stuff. Um, and I, I, my point, sorry, incredibly long-winded and rambling point but like all i really wanted to say while sort of name dropping all the dvds i watched was that eventually by 17 or 18 years old i looked at all these dvds and went i'm not going to replicate this stuff in hitchin i've right. got to get out of here yeah i've got if i'm going to get close to any of these kinds of crowds or stages or anything i gotta go right and I didn't like leaving. I was a kid who didn't like going to London, which was only an hour away. I didn't mm. like leaving Hitchin un until this moment, this realization. You went to Brighton first, yeah. is that right? To, to study there? Yeah. Brighton is, <laughs> I did go to study. Um, <laughs> I didn't quite kind of go, that didn't, that didn't go to plan. Right. Lucy had started uni in Brighton. She'd been there for a year and I was going to visit her like every weekend and just obsessing over this brilliant place full of creative people and sort of graffiti and music and theatre and all sorts of cool stuff going on in the streets and everywhere. And they had a music school down there. So I went down, um, I did a little audition and I got in and, and, and I went down to to be there and the classes were with all respect they were they were they were fine and lovely but like it was more for me about the teachers because they they had genuine experience working in music either behind the scenes at labels or or touring with different bands and stuff like that and then just the place it was just a slightly bigger hitching mm. um hitching was small so it was quite a lot bigger than hitching but it was nowhere near as big as it's, brighton's not as big as london at all um so it's like a it's like a little sort of it's a it's the first rung on the ladder to London. Sure. And uh, it really gave me an opportunity. Again, like, I, you know, I'm coming from Hitchin where we've managed to bag seven gigs a week. So 
<laughs> so I was out in, there was, I remember a street, there was more than one street like this. There was many streets like this in Brighton, but I remember one near this train station. Coming out of the train station in Brighton, you, you sort of straight into pubs and bars. And there's a street, it's either called Queens Road or something like that. And there was about three or four on this street holding an open mic night on the same night. So I'd get down to the first one for seven, be done and out of there by 7.30, 7.45. Because you've got to get your name down, wait a minute, do your three right. songs, and then you can pack up and go. Go down two doors down to the next one, three doors down to the next one. So by 10 or 11 in the evening, when everyone's starting to sort of finish their open mic night, I've probably done three or four, and it's Monday night. Wow. And those were, gr those were great times. Because you can you only do three songs, and, you know, I wanted to do a set. You were driven. You were very driven. I, I don't know. I just loved it. It was, it was, it was... I was driven to, I suppose one thing I do always remember as far as being driven is that going into those rooms, like I might have said to you earlier, sorry, I'm doing lots of interviews all the time and I've either said this to you or someone else, but I'll, I'll say it stand, I'll say it stand alone. Going into those rooms, playing open mic nights, you've got to win the crowd over. Mm -hmm. They're not there. No one's at a pub for the open mic night. That's yeah. the hard truth. Yeah. It says open mic night on the door. And if there's a few people in the room, they're hoping nobody signs up. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they, or, or they've come, or they've come down for their mate, and they're going to talk through your set. Right. So the reason, as far as being driven, what I loved is I came in with maybe one cover, but a bunch of songs that I've been writing that week, and I thought they were oh so good. Mm. But I would experience everybody talking until like the middle eight, or everybody talking until the second half of what was a chorus that was actually way too long. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, well they all sort of put their drinks down and turn their heads when I sang that bit. But I lost them in the verse. Verse has got to be better. Interesting. I've got to go home and work on that verse. Yeah. So I would go home and work on that verse and I'd try and make it better. And, you know, it was the same experience busking in Brighton as well. I was doing that as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. One of the things that I think I've read you talking about that time in Brighton is one of the things you learned there at uh, the Institute of Modern Music was it taught you about how much you had to want it. And, and I've also oh, seen yes. you talk about the fact that you had no idea how hungry you needed to be to actually stick around in this in this industry. Like, how how did that hunger manifest? Was it just through doing things like that, though? That relentless dedication to open mic nights, to analysing your songs, was that the the hunger that you're that you were feeding? How did it manifest? Yes, you you've kind of hit the nail on the head. It was all of those things. The experience. So having done shows, open mic nights, and stuff in my hometown from the age of 14 to 18 or 19 by the time I left to, to go to Brighton. Having done that for five plus years, as often as I possibly could, I really kind of grew to love it. And what's interesting is when I left Hitchin, I think I left at the right time because I was starting to, if I'm being really honest with you, I, I was starting to not believe the audience anymore. This is what I mean by that with all love and respect to them because I do love them all and it was just the most important time. But it came a point where it was the same faces, same faces, same faces. Mm. They was drinking a bit more. They were listening a little bit less because they were comfortable with us lads yet again in the corner doing our thing, fun Friday night, fun whatever, Thursday night, Saturday, Sunday night, whatever. Yeah. Oh, same faces. I don't know if I'm actually good anymore or if I ever was or if this is just a fun night for them. So, so, when I, so here's the thing. So I went through many years in Hitchin where I loved that and I, and I believed that it was all going quite well um, in my own little head, in my own little way. Uh, and then that thing happened that I just explained then. And then I got to Brighton and I did, I, I kind of relatively quickly sort of got to this place where I would play somewhere. These aren't the open mics. These are the nights where someone sort of see me at open mic and they say, come and play my night. And I, we, they do a poster and you put it mm -hmm. on your Facebook and all of my space from my space. Um, <laughs> and I played in front of 20, 40, 50 people in Brighton, maybe even a bit more than that in some venues. And they cheer and they weren't the people in Hitchin. Right. They were new people. They were new people who were quite, who were like kind of into what I was doing. And I was up there on my own with an acoustic guitar most of the time. I put some bands together now and again. But I thought, oh shit, I, maybe I'm okay at this. And if I, and it, what, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's addictive. It's a, it's a, it's an incredible feeling. If sure. you are a performer, then you, you, then there's no, there's no two ways about it. You do like that experience and you enjoy sharing it and you enjoy what it creates as a commun, a communal sort of moment. So, more than anything, yeah, I, I, I recognized and everybody would sort of say all the time, okay, you know, that's all well and good, mate, but can you do this? Can you go this far? Can you go to the next? Can you, you know, or, or are you just this good? Yeah. You know, is yeah. there a ceiling to this? Um, and I always, I love the challenge. I'm a competitive person and I liked the challenge of, of saying, well, oh, watch this. Right. You know, uh, and trying to prove people, anybody who thought I couldn't, 
and I, I respect to everybody there, they were very encouraging and supportive. But if there's any part of my mind or anybody else's that thought he might bottle this, then I liked to sort of try and rise to the challenge. And Brighton offered that. And then London, you know, it was a sure. whole different thing. Sure. Again, you know, when I, when I got there. I'm going to jump forward a few years and just get to the chaos and the calm and your debut album when yeah. that starts to take off. All this groundwork you've done, all the open mic nights, the the gigs, the Brighton studying. Yeah. Did that prepare you in any way for the giant success that came with the chaos and the calm? Ooh. Gigs prepare you for something. It's like you can't just walk into Wembley, referee blows the whistle. You've got to have kicked a ball before. <laughs> sure. You know, so, but it is Wembley. It is the World Cup final. Um, I'm tr- sorry, that I'm suddenly, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing whatever I've achieved to the World <laughs> Cup final, and they're not quite the same thing. The World Cup final is a very big deal. I'm just trying to say that the throwing myself into and amongst it in Brighton and in London and in all the years before I met a record label or whatever, that, that does a, maybe five or 10% worth of preparing. And it's an important five or ten percent. It's a it's an important little foundation layer. It's really important, and I know it did something. And I'm very I wouldn't change a thing about that, that time. You know, people they reference people say you've got to do your thousand hours of practice or whatever whatever it is you're doing. And I think that was me doing that stuff because you have to take every sort of curveball. And I learned a lot about performing in those places. And there's not really a lot of difference between opening up for someone in Brixton Academy, five thousand people. And having to deal with them all talking through my set versus a pub with 12 people in it all talking. Right. I learned how to silence the 12. <laughs> okay. And it worked in front of 5,000. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Not, probably not every time. I'll, I'll, let's be real. I think there was, there was moments, but it, I, I had moments in each set when I was opening for people by the time I'd sort of done a record deal and, 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 and was being sent out on more substantial tours opening up for people where I walked out on stage. Nobody knows who you are. You're the support act. Nobody sure. knows. Nobody really cares. You ask them if they're excited to see the headliner and strangely that gets them on side a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And you say, well, give me 20 minutes and then he's all yours, whoever the headliner may be. And even that, you know, you learn about how to talk to a crowd, how to kind of get them on side. And so what am I trying to say? As far as suddenly releasing my own album later on, you know, 2015, there's so much of that rise that I wasn't prepared for. Nothing can prepare you for it. Nothing can prepare you for certain, for, for certain rises, Yeah, to call it that. Maybe nothing's supposed to. Yeah. It's, it's a mad time. It's traumatic, even in a good way. Well, you, you used that analogy, or not even an analogy, but you said that, that all that groundwork prepared you for about 5 to 10% of it. So what was of the other 90% that you had to learn on the fly – what, what, was the big, what were some of the biggest things you had to just come to grips with? Um, biggest things I had to come to grips with, come to terms with, hmm, crowd size, frequency. You know, you're playing at this, you're playing the Isle of Wight Festival in front of 50,000 people tomorrow. Uh, and then the next day, you've got to do a radio thing, a live lounge on BBC Radio 1. Uh, you've got to be in at 9 a.m. to sing at 11 and we've got to travel in between and bus life and like traveling on a bus and all these different things. You're going to go to Australia and people are kind of going to know who you are. Right. What? I've never been to Australia before. You know, that, that's a lot of the sort of 90% of the rest of it. That, that I think trying to make every single show feel like it's going to be the most memorable show for the crowd. That hasn't changed and it never will. And there are moments when people around me will say, just try and dial it back tonight for the sake of saving your voice, this, that, and the other. And it just doesn't work. Mm. I just, I walk on stage and between adrenaline and the look in the audience's eyes, I, ha- I just say, I just have to mean it all. I can't. So what am I trying to say? Um, that, that, that 90% is kind of how good you are on the fly. You can't, that, that you're not really supposed to be able to sort of rehearse for the other 90%. You just have to rise to the occasion. Yeah, right. Um, it's a little bit, in a way, it's, it's, so it's incredibly exciting, but it's a little bit terrifying. And that's the mix that it, that's the cocktail that it always should be. Yeah. Did you have, have a, a mentor or someone who'd been through it that you could talk to about it or someone who would help show you the ropes? Not really. Not really at all. But my, one of my managers had had an artist, um, one of my managers, manages a guy called James Morrison, who I'm a huge fan of. He's sure. a super wonderful artist. And he, so one of my managers manages him. And um, he'd seen that kind of rise. Uh, so he, he, he ha- always had some words of wisdom, which were always welcome, obviously. I will say, actually, there were moments along the journey where 
um, of all people, Ed Sheeran would say, he would always say, you know, give me a call if you need to sort of to talk about it. Because he'd said that in his experience as he was coming up, there wasn't really someone for him to talk to. He didn't find that the people he was sharing the rise with, because you're always kind of coming up at the same time as a couple other people around you. He just didn't have that opportunity and it always sort of made him a bit sad. So he mm -hmm. said, hey, you know, we're close enough on this journey. That was very flattering of him to say. He was absolutely soaring <laughs> literally into Wembley and it wasn't a cup final. That was literally his show. Yeah. On the, by the, by, at the time that I was sort of coming through, but he was very kind in saying that and he's always been, man, he's always been available. To, to chat, which is which is very kind, but I mean, you know, he's obviously a busy guy as well, so that's sure. not. I can't say he was a mentor. Yeah, no, but yeah, he was he was he was very sort of kind about that, and so just sort of along the way, I don't know, you sort of, I tried to sort of talk about the experience with anybody I ran into, but my 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 sort of moments of opening up for Taylor Swift or or meeting the Stones or whatever it may, they they are fleeting. Mm. They, you know, they are often half an hour. You know, right. it's not, it's not, it's really cool that people think we're big buddies. Um, but nobody's, often people have, we haven't got the sort of time to sort of connect and stay connected, which is sad. I'm sad to say, because I'd love for it to be more, but it is what it is. Everybody's busy. Absolutely. Um, just a couple more things, uh, James, and then I'll let you go. Um, we're good. You, you mentioned earlier in the interview that, um, you know, if you achieve something, you'll celebrate for a day and then the next day you're sort of moving on or, or what's the next thing? With that mindset, did you take time to? Um, were you? Did you allow yourself time to um, celebrate the successes when they when they came initially after that? All that hard work had gone to getting to that point. As you ask me that question, I think about um, receiving like plaques and discs. Uh, it's unbelievable that I can say it even now, but I got given lots of different framed things that were sort of recognition of the achievement. And they went straight into storage wow. and they're still there. Right. So in a way, I didn't quite, I don't think I did. I, I know this though. I know that I can look at those things and I will in the future and I'll reminisce and I'll sort of smile and I'll feel pride. But in the moment, everybody was there around me, Lucy, my managers, my label, to raise a glass and say, literally to open a bottle, raise a glass and say, well done, you know, but I think what's important is that they all said, we would all always say the work starts here. Right. You know, it doesn't matter what they're selling out a show or a song streaming or selling or however many or whatever. But also, very importantly, I would like to say that whatever little bit of celebrating we did was fine. I've still got so much that I want to achieve, to prove, to show for myself. It really does feel like the beginning. It sounds a little cliche, but it really does. I, you know... It's taken an extra pandemic's worth of years, two years, to get my third album out. Um, I, I think I would have liked to be on my fourth by this point, but um, obviously the world had to stop for a bit. But um, so I've still got a lot that I really that I that I want to show, sure. that I want to prove. Nice. Very last question. Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people you give credit to for helping you get where you are today? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Lucy, always first and foremost. My managers, Paul and Ryan. We've been working together just over 10 years. Uh, they heard a song I wrote that I put on my MySpace and they came down to Brighton to sort of to meet me and and it all kind of went from there. Uh, my A&R my guy, Ben Adelson, saw this video of me playing in a pub and it was at a time when YouTube overnight success was all the rage. <laughs> YouTube overnight success was all the rage. Uh, you had various artists being discovered on a sort of overnight 500,000 views. <gasps> there was a video of me on YouTube. It had been there for about six weeks and it had 25 views on it. But Ben saw the video and flew me out to New York and said, we really think you're great. And they tried to sign me there and then, but they also let me go away and think about it. And then I came back and, and yeah. signed with them. So there's lots and lots and lots of other people that, you know, I, there really are. It, it takes a village, you know, Andy and Paul, my agents in, in the UK, who, uh, who, who put a lot of my gigs on for me around the world. They really... Are very smart people and, and Kirk in America who puts my shows on over there he's a very smart man he knows what he's doing <laughs> um, you know there's 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 a lot the, the, the list is endless Taylor who does all my press in in America and, and Janet who does all my press in the UK and it, th these people they're vital I just know how to write songs and sing them and perform them and, <laughs> and all, all these people have sort of believed in me for 10 years now 
it's a long time. Music moves very fast. Attention spans are shorter than ever. Absolutely. We've spoken for an hour. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm into it. I'm into it though. I'm into it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. So th- man, there's lots, there's lots and lots of people. Nice. Uh, and the list goes on. Awesome. James, thank you so much for all your time. It's been so great chatting to you today. Thank you, Rod. I hope we make it to, we will make it to Australia sooner or later and hopefully I'll see you in a venue somewhere. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to James for his time and thank you for listening. Just a reminder that James's latest album, Leap, is out now. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jackster.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening.